Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some recent results we have using complex knowledge as well uh, on the heavy quarks model. And uh, at the end of this presentation, I added some extra plots of a new technique we developed, and I will uh, say more details later. So, um, some motivation we we do complex on Japan because, well, the same reason everyone does, because of the same problem. And on uh, QCD, the same problem appears uh, on the Fermi determinant because you have uh, uh, real chemical potential, the Fermi determinant is complex, and you cannot do important sampling anymore, so we have to resort to other techniques. Uh, a few of them have been mentioned here. Uh, by the speakers, like for because they work on that, or just as a comparison, such as uh, reweighting and Taylor expansion and whatnot. But most of them, not to say all, uh, have problems when the sign problem gets too severe, and then you have to do something else. And um, so, a brief introduction to stochastic quantization, which is the basic uh, thing on which uh, complex uh, um, is, is what is based on. So we uh, add a new fictitious uh, dimension to the gauge fields and evolve those fields uh, using a Langevin equation like this. So uh, S is the action, uh, eta is a white noise field satisfying these uh, properties here. And uh, the quantum expectation values are given by, the, by this average at a large time, at large Langevin time after the system has thermalized in a certain sense. So uh, on the lattice, we use uh, this equation, this discretization for the Langevin equation. And x is a, is a drift force for the Langevin equation, where uh, this d here is given uh, like this. It's a, a gauge group derivative. The rest is uh, trivial stuff, uh, Gelman matrices, again, the noise field. And epsilon is our step size, which uh, is chosen adaptively according to how large this drift is. Uh, and to deal with the sign problem, we have to, well, we use complex Langevin. Now comes the complex part. So we allow the gauge fields, if you think in terms of continuum fields, to be uh, complex. On the lattice, that means we are not on SU3 anymore, but we are on the larger group on SL3C. And uh, we have to update, we have to change a little bit uh, the action because it has to be holomorphic. And to keep it holomorphic, we use uh, U inverse instead of U dagger. Because now uh, it's U inverse uh, who represents the links pointing in the backwards direction. And if you are on SU3, those two definitions coincide. So that's, that's why. And the, the, the plaquette is now written like this. So instead of uh, U daggers, just put U inverses. And the uh, Wilson action is written in this form. But we have to be careful, as uh, the previous speaker has shown, uh, with the unitary norm. So basically, we measure how far the system is from the SU3 manifold. And if it, if it gets too far, we know that the system, the, the, the simulation doesn't converge to a right result, or maybe it doesn't converge at all. So we, we measure this at every Langevin uh, step. And between two Langevin steps, we apply uh, these gauge transformations, the gauge cooling, uh, mentioned by many different speakers here and also in, in Southampton. So we apply this transformation, which does not change the SU3 part of the gauge links. It only acts on the orthogonal part, so only on SL3C, but keeping the SU3 part the same, so it shouldn't change the physics. It's uh, this force here, this term here, appearing inside the, is it work? Appearing inside the, 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 uh, the transformation matrix is given by this. It's basically a derivative of this force, uh, of this distance d. And here we have this parameter uh, alpha, which is chosen adaptively, depending on how strong, how large f is. And also the number of uh, cooling steps is changed adaptively. So 
to have a good efficiency in the code. Um, now about the algorithm we simulated. Uh, it's the using the heavy quark approximation. So this is the quark determinant we've written in its almost its full glory if you ignore the spatial parts of the Fermi determinant. And here we do uh, things exactly. So first we we still have the determinant in terms of uh, space-time indices, color indices, and spin indices. Flavors I'm not showing because we're using uh, the, all the quarks have the same mass, so it's, it's trivial to do the flavor the flavor determinant. So if you do the spin determinant, this guy can be split in this these other two, and then after you do the space-time determinant, you get this product over the spatial uh, position. And the uh, determinant can be written in terms of the Polyakov loop, given uh, here. And uh, here, just for completeness, I'm showing that uh, this guy's the lattice translation, the time direction, and also this uh, gamma matrices. And why we study this model? Because uh, it exhibits a time problem. So this determinant is also uh, complex for real chemical potential. And uh, it has another interesting feature, which is that at a uh, this value of the chemical potential at zero temperature, we have a transition from zero uh, quark density to a lattice completely full of quarks. And at finite temperature, this, this picture changes a little bit, the transition still happens, I'm going to show that. Uh, this is the setup we used, so we used beta 5.8, it's like larger than the previous speaker. Uh, okay. Uh, which gives us a, a approximate, approximate lattice spacing of 0.15 Fermi. Um, the hopping parameter was 0.04, so the quarks were indeed very heavy, which gives us a critical chemical potential of this value. We have uh, three uh, different volumes, 6 cubed, 8 cubed, and 10 cubed, with two flavors and uh, many different uh, temperatures, going from about 50 MeV to almost 700 MeV. So, um, the observables we, we uh, studied were the Polyakov loop, and here we do this, this uh, symmetric version of the Polyakov loop, so P plus P inverse, because we wanted to see, look only at the real part, but we cannot take real part here because it's not holomorphic. So we use this definition, which uh, at mu equals zero is the same as taking the real part, and also the quark number density. Now to uh, go to some results, uh, this plot here is the, Polyakov, the average Polyakov loop as a function of the chemical potential and the temperature, and here the same for the, the quark density. And you can see that in this purple region here uh, we have confinement, and after a certain temperature or chemical potential the, we have the confinement, and on the, the quark density plot we see that the transition I mentioned which at zero temperature is completely sharp, it gets smoother with, uh, with the temperature as you go here. And, but the whole point of this uh, study was to, to map the boundary between the confined and the confined phases. And to do that, we use the Binder cumulant, which is defined like this. And the two interesting, the two interesting uh, regimes for the Binder cumulant are, uh, well, and when B is equal to zero, where we have confinement, and B is equal to two thirds, which means we have a deconfinement. So here is a 3D plot for the binder cumulant, same way, uh, chemical potential here and temperature. And this is a, a two dimensional projection, so this boundary here you can see here. And from this, uh, from uh, all the uh, black points are um, our data points, the things, the, all the simulations we've done. So. As you can see, there were quite a few simulations. And this is only for uh, 10 cubed, but we have we've done everything for all three volumes. So we, using this data, we mapped uh, this boundary line, which can be seen here for 10 cubed. And we tried to, to fit this line with three different uh, functions. So uh, the first fit was just a simple polynomial. The second one is a polynomial where we impose that at uh, the, at mu critical, the, temp the critical temperature is zero. And the third one has also the same feature as fit B, but also it tries to reproduce the non-analytic behavior we expect 
from thermodynamics around this region. And during the fits, we saw that fit A and fit B are completely compatible, so that means that our data, um, it doesn't, we don't have to, to impose the fit to, be, to go through zero here. It comes naturally from the data. But also, uh, we don't have enough uh, resolution at low temperature to see any non-analytic behavior. So alpha was compatible with one, and we ended up not using fit C. It didn't have any extra information. So here I show the phase boundary using fit B for three different uh, orders of the polynomial. So the second, well, uh, the polynomial is, is, uh, is an even function, so uh, fourth order, sixth, and eighth order. And you can see all the lines here look OK. But uh, using uh, chi-squared analysis, we saw that n equals 2 had the best chi-squared, so we stuck to that one. Here you see that uh, the boundary lines, the fits for all three data, so 6 cubed, 8 cubed, and 10 cubed. And you can see that there is a, a, a volume dependence, but it seems to be getting smaller for from, well, from 6 to 8 compared to uh, 8 to, to 10, it gets smaller, the difference, which is expected and, and, and good. And well, this is the main uh, result from, from our, uh, our paper. And, but of course, uh, there are uh, other things that we learned in this process, and um, they relate to situations where complex Langevin does not work as well as expected, which I'm going to talk about now. So um, in this instability section, um, it's, this plot here shows the Polyakov loop uh, here in purple and in green the unitary norm for this particular setup of uh, heavy dense quarks. It's not too different from what uh, the previous speakers showed, that the unitary norm starts in a, in a nice region, so very small, <coughs> but it, it increases and stays at order one. And when this happens, we see that the, the Polyakov loop changes behavior. And of course, someone could say, well, this, this is the physical part, and this was a thermalization. But you can see if you uh, do histograms uh, for before it rises too much, and after, so here's before, here's after, that the distribution after is completely, well, almost nonsensical, I could say. And of course, in this case, you can also compare, in this situation, uh, the sign problem is mild, so you can compare with real weighting, and we know that the right result is around this region here and not around zero. So uh, we tried to, to do something about it, and same idea as the previous speaker, we went for a higher beta, so uh, we had 5.8 and we increased to 6.2, so a drastic change to see if that helps. It does help a little bit. It pushes the instability a bit forward, but it doesn't solve it, so it's still here. And uh, about the result, I cannot say much. We don't have anything to compare it with, but it's, it's hard to say. Uh, no, knowing this, it's hard to say that this is entirely correct or entirely wrong. We'd have to do uh, further tests and, and comparisons. And now I'm going to talk about the, the, the new ideas we, we've been testing, and this is a work in progress, and further, we can, of course, during the questions, you can ask me something, but if there's no time, you can ask my colleague. He has a poster outside, so has uh, more plots and more information. Um, we tried this new idea we call the dynamic stabilization, which is shown here in green, and uh, this yellow line is the result from real weighting, and you can see that Using dynamic stabilization, there doesn't seem to be any problem at all with uh, uh, the Polyakov loop, in this case, changing behavior. And we have a test for other cases, I'm not showing sure here, but we can discuss later, where using dynamic stabilization, we see no problem whatsoever. The unitary norm is under control for the entire uh, simulation. And the results seem, well, the results seem to agree with no uh, results from others, uh, other methods. And if you look at histograms, I'm not showing here, but uh, they also seem okay. I mean, there's no, we don't see anything like this, not remotely. Uh, so this dynamic stabilization is a new force we add to the Langevin drift. It is constructed in such a way that it goes to the continuum limit really fast. So the idea is that it's trivial in the continuum limit, so we're not changing the physics. It's supposed to be just a lattice artifact. And 
it's also it also depends if you expand in terms of uh, of the gauge uh, links, the continuum gauge links, uh, gauge field. Sorry, it only depends at least to leading order on the imaginary part of the fields. So as this grows, this force will grow as well. But at some point, we reach some kind of equilibrium, and the unitary norm is under control, and everything seems to be fine at least in what we tested so far. So the new drift, uh, thank you. The new drift is is written like this. So we just have a. Uh, step size in front and this coefficient which is like the uh, in principle track the gauge cooling coefficient we, we could fix it in, we have it fixed but we could make it also adaptive in, in the future as a as another test and I'm going to show some final results now uh, again from from uh, my colleagues poster so this is the chiral condensate for this particular setup using uh, staggered fermions and you can see that it seems to behave really well I cannot really comment on the lattice spacing or anything like that. We don't know the lattice spacing here, so we also don't know the temperature. But at least <laughs> visually, it looks nice. It, it doesn't have any 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 craziness. Uh, the, the error bars are barely visible, or are not visible in this in this plot. And the only thing I have to mention is that this those points here are in gray because the the inversion of the Fermi matrix got a little bit complicated, so we are not entirely sure this region can be trusted, but judging by how well it looks with the rest, maybe maybe it can. And here I showed the, uh, the susceptibility for the chiral condensate, and now you can see some error bars. They get, of course, larger at, uh, around the transition, but that's more than expected. But still, uh, this plot looks really nice. And uh, of course, it would be nice to decrease the mass and, and compare this with other results and maybe change NF from two to four so we don't have any potential issues with routing. But still, that, as I said, this is a work very much in progress. This is very recent plot. So there's still a lot to be, to be studied about this new technique. And to summarize my talk, uh, we used complex Langevin to simulate uh, theory with the same problem. Uh, combining with gauge cooling, we could map the, the phase diagram for heavy quarks with uh, real chemical potential. And of course, uh, we saw some instabilities. We had to deal with them somehow. And sometimes it, they limited uh, our, the amount of statistics available. But that, that's what uh, got us to try new ideas and led to, for instance, this. And as an outlook, we want to do the same uh, study using uh, staggered quarks and using our new technique because uh, we only have to worry about the fermions being difficult to invert, not really about uh, the instabilities like this appearing from, from complex algebra for whatever reason they appear. Thank you. Session is open for questions. So I was very struck looking at your phase diagram that you seem to have much more uncertainty in the top left than in the bottom right, which is the opposite way around to most of us. So yes, uh, do you have any insight into that? Yes, this is because um, here we move. Well, we're always moving in steps of uh, one in uh, n tau. Yeah. So here, like the, the the temperature goes as one over n tau. So to do this region better, we'd have to go for different betas and things like that. So we, we didn't do that. That's why the error bars are so big. OK, so one of the n tau is getting smaller as you go down to the bottom line. Yes. OK, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think you have tried to, you have computed some cumulant, some, ex some moments, right? Uh, uh, I was wondering if you have tried to compute higher order. No, we haven't. We just used uh, these ones uh, because of being the cumulant, because it, it helps getting a clear signal for the transition. It's easier to, to get it from the being accumulant than from susceptibility, for instance. Okay, any other questions? Can you show the comparison between the dynamical stability transition and the weighting? I have my question, but uh, is it okay to have to okay, the consistency between these two results? I think the 
at finite lattice spacing, the dynamical stabilization changes the action. So I think they are studying a different system. I think it's natural to have some systematic deviation from the remaining. Yes, I mean, you're right in the sense that it's, it's changing the, the, the artist's action, but uh, as I show um, here, it's a a to the 7, and the normal uh, real song action, for instance, is a to the 4. So I assume the effect at least should be small enough. I mean, we haven't done a systematic test to see that's on our, uh, on our future plans, but uh, if I, I don't show uh, numbers here, but if you compare the the number we get from these green uh, points and the error bars, they are really good, surprisingly good compared to, to real weight. So that's why we're very hopeful on this technique. But yes, it demands lots of testing. Any other questions? Uh, for the unitarity norm for small, small mu, say, close to zero? Well, n not here. <laughs> we, we have looked into that, but this kind of uh, instability, we did not find any, any pattern on why, when it should appear. It seems to appear, prefer some re we didn't find any preferred regions for it to appear. So I cannot really say. If, yes, uh, but I mean with your extra with your extra term, which is supposed to yes. does that make the mu equals zero go to be very small, the unitarity norm? Um, I'm not sure if we checked that, but I would believe so. I mean, for non-zero mu it works, so I do believe that for zero mu we should have no problem and possibly uh, should be the same as real Langevin. I, 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 we haven't checked. A quick comment. Your last stuff on the 8 to the 4th lattices. They are at values of beta, which are such that uh, right near the end, oh. we, when you were showing, yes, things on this 8 to the 4th lattice yes. with beta 6.4. Yes. Of course, that is in the deconfined, well into the deconfined region. Okay. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't think so because the carbon is state is non zero. It's, it's uh, yes, but on eight to the fourth lattice, then if it was two, the transition, at mt equals eight, the transition to from deconfined, from confined to deconfined occurs at, you know, beta of something like 5.4, or maybe by the time you're at. Uh, mass of 0 0.05, say 5.5. So this is way, in fact, it's in beta value that it be above the transition even for which. Okay. Okay. Thank you. The comment to the first question. <laughs> Uh, just shortly can comment on the first question. Um, by high dense, um, the cage cooling is sufficient to keep at zero mu to keep it actually exactly to zero up to an American position, 10 to minus 20, whatever. Cage cooling with the uh, extra. Even, even without the extra force. I mean, without cage cooling. Sorry. Cage cooling. Uh, yes, cage so cooling and the force. And yes. Some I think you're right, probably, but the patient happens to be after this. Okay. Definitely. More questions? Just one. No? Then let's go to the sessions. <laughs>